Thank you for joining us. I'm joined here today by my colleagues, Damien, Leo, and Mir. And today we'll be discussing some of the most common questions and concerns we get from our customers related to the development of CO2 storage projects. And let me just set the scene a little bit before we dive into some of those questions. The Global CCS Institute actually announced a 102% increase in projects under development in 2023. That's a significant and record-breaking increase. So there's now 392 projects uh, currently in development and over 10 actually entered operation. However, despite all this very exciting momentum, there is still only a handful of projects every year that reach a final investment decision and actually enter construction. And a lot of things hindering this progress are related to long-term economics and costs. And perhaps, Damien, you can start us off by discussing some of the questions and concerns you hear from our customers related to the cost sides. Well, there's certainly many topics that customers want to talk about, but there is a recurring theme around cost optimization and specifically around operating costs. In the case of CCS, operating costs is actually more relevant than development and construction costs over the lifetime of the project. And the key component of this operating cost is what we call MMV monitoring, measurement, and verification. So it's really at the forefront of people's mind to understand how they go about developing an MMV plan. It's particularly relevant because, one, they have to embed the strategy, that plan early on in the cycle, from the moment they apply for a permit, that they go into a licensing mode. They need to know and tell the regulator what they're going to do about this. There is also an aspect of transparency and openness that is not necessarily the uh, common practices in other industries that might make some people nervous about this. Uh, and there is the aspect that regulation exists, but are still relatively vague. Before uh, jumping in, what is MMV? Really is uh, regulatory requirements mandated by the regulator to tell you uh, what data you need to provide to uh, understand really where the CO2 uh, is injected and behaves and what are the corrective measures that you can take. Before doing any MMV plan, you need to understand your reservoir, basically. And the reservoir is typically characterized around three components, the containment, the capacity, and injectivity. We've been around for a while. We've been participating in around 150 projects around the world. We've been doing subsurface characterization for 100 years, and so we can apply a lot of our learning to CCS as well. We know this is not a 1D or 2D or three-dimensional issue. It's actually a four-dimensional issue that you need to measure over time to see how your CO2 behave. And you do that with a combination of modeling capabilities and measurement to have certainty and management of your risk. Once your site is uh, characterized, the next thing that you need to do is really to model scenarios to determine the most cost-effective way to develop your MMV plan. You have to ask yourself some questions around how many injector wells are you going to drill? How many monitoring wells are you going to drill? Um, where do you place them? What type of information do you need to acquire over time? And that might change uh, to satisfy your needs, etc. So this is all part of your MMV plan. Damien, you've walked us through quite a bit of MMV, all the way from the planning and modeling side through to operations. Leo, perhaps you can lead us through how does one develop a cost-effective MMV plan for a CO2 storage project? We see the MMV plan, obviously, as a requirement from the regulators in many, in many of the jurisdictions in which we work. But it's also an opportunity to make a risk-based plan for, for managing all of the things that could go wrong in the field. So the main th the three risks that a developer will have to contend with here are well integrity, uh, injection operations, or anything related to injection operations, and plume monitoring or pressure plume monitoring. So injection operation has to do with the integrity of all of the wells that are going to be in this complex. And that means the new wells, the injectors, and the monitoring wells that will be drilled, and all of the legacy and existing wells. Then we have everything related to the injection operation, and it has to do with all of the parameters that you have set in your modeling that you will execute, the injection rate, the capacity that you're going to fulfill in, in this reservoir. Uh, so you need to monitor all of those things in, in the wells that you're operating. And finally, you need to know where the plume is going. You want to know that the plume is not going into problematic features, either in the subsurface or in the surface. Out of all the, the different measurements that are available for an MMV plan, 
we can roughly group them into four categories. So surface uh, and, and shallow depth measurements. Then we have everything related to well integrity, all of the measurements related to operational injection and operational uh, management. And finally, the plume, uh, CO2 plume and pressure plume migration. Everything related to surface monitoring, this has to do with geochemical analysis of groundwater, uh, soil sampling, air sampling. There's, there's a lot of measurements there that need to be collected on a, on a regular frequency uh, to make sure that the CO2 is not migrating all the way up to surface. Then we have all of the measurements related to well integrity, and this has to making sure that the, the CO2 is not leaking through the wells. And this has to do with the injector wells, the monitoring wells, which are the new wells in the plan, and all of the legacy wells that were there from before. Then we have all of the measurements related to the operational parameters of the site. This has to do with flow rates, temperature, uh, pressures, and not just uh, uh, at surface, but also downhole. And finally, the CO2 plume migration and also the pressure plume. Uh, this is probably the, the, the hardest one to, to monitor it because the measurements that we have available are not direct measurements of where the CO2 is. Having all of those measurements put together, this is what makes a comprehensive MMB plan that allows you to really uh, understand how your site is operating, but also making sure that the integrity of the site is sound, and that you're not going to run into any issues with the regulators or with the local community, with uh, the different stakeholders that are uh, in this type of projects. Yeah, and I think that gets into, obviously, a lot of aspects of costs. We've been discussing, you know, the, the cost of a seismic survey versus maybe a downhole tool or a soil sample can be very different from one another. So obviously, the frequency at which we take those measurements is quite important. But there's also cost from even an optimization perspective. You know, in the end, there is a capacity that the storage developer wants to fill. So it's quite important, not just from a conformance and a CO2 plume and potentially an event, right, that occurs. There's also, we want to fill this storage space as efficiently and optimally as possible, right? Absolutely. And taking all those measurements during the lifetime of the project, you will have to take all of that information and bake it back into your model and recalibrate, right? Because you start with an assumption that you're going to be able to inject X amount of tons per year and, and over a number of years, the total capacity. But that could change over time. Feeding back all of that information will be key to, uh, to the economics of the project. And having a digital ecosystem in place to where you can very quickly and easily incorporate new data is quite important. That's very true. I think... Uh injection performance and injectivity has uh, a very large impact on the project economics. And um, having an accurate model and being able to conduct multiple realization of that model and update it in real time, maintain an evergreen model of the geological storage is very important, not only to predict non-performance event, but also to plan and optimize that injection. Naturally, the CO2 has tendency to migrate upward and in a multi-well hub, then will migrate laterally as it hit uh, less uh, permeable zones. And then when those pressure fronts will collide, uh, there will be a deterioration of injectivity and there will be pore space that will not be utilized properly. That will reduce the overall effective capacity of the storage hub, affecting the economics, requiring potentially drilling of infill wells or injecting in different zones that were not initially planned to be injected in. And all of that will require capital expenditure, will affect the performance and the uptime of the site and will have tremendous impact on the project economics. So again, back to the importance of digital tools and being able to model and predict and identify non-performance events in addition to having the right contingency plans and emergency response plans to intervene and remediate those non-performance events is very critical. Exactly. MMV, it's just something I need to have, right, to report to regulatory authorities. But I think we're raising some valuable points on the importance of MMV and MMV planning to optimize the performance of your site. There's a regulatory requirement to make sure that the CO2 stays where it's at and that it's not causing any harm to anybody. But let's remember that the majority of the cases, these projects are being monetized by um, some sort of a, an incentive or a public funding that you will have to come up with the, with the proof that the CO2 has been stored, the amount that you say, that it's staying there and it's not, it's not going anywhere or, or back into the atmosphere. MMV also enables the monetization of the project. And if you don't have that very well tied down, you may very well find yourself in a situation where you're not going to be able to get your credits because you can't prove that you did what you said that you did. And I think that ties back to what Damien started us talking about as well, which is the transparency aspects, right? When it comes to a lot of this reporting and measurement that there is a much stronger need to be transparent in this process. Uh, you know, 
not least of which because quite a few of these projects are funded by public dollars right now. It is something being stored underneath the feet of everyday people, right? So there is a need to be transparent about exactly what's being injected, where that CO2 is going, and ensuring it is staying where you expected it to stay. But maybe we can switch gears a bit and talk a bit more about the compliance side of things. And Damien, perhaps you can uh, enlighten us a bit more on the uh, compliance aspects. Sure. And compliance is all about what the regulators tell you, or what you need to do or don't need to do. Not all regulations are born equal. Typically, the agency and the, the regulatory body will look at the highest areas of risk for you to manage. It's all about well integrity, making sure there is no leakage from your well flume, monitoring, making sure it is going where you, you're supposed to. And the last point is really around um, not interfering with existing or future subsurface activity. This is with really what you need to do to make sure that the, your regulator is happy uh, about your operation. As we talked about, it's all about a risk-based approach um, so your plan will have to address those risks using the right technologies. Uh, there are many technologies out there. They all have very different costs, different frequencies. And so coming up with an integrated plan uh, is quite a complex optimization uh, system we need to put in place. We've been taking the learnings and the lessons learned from past projects to understand the effectiveness of some of those technologies and how they best come together. And of course, we can use digital modeling and um, high-performance computing to help us run different scenarios in coming up with optimized pathways. This is actually a very interesting point because a lot of the measurements that we're going to be taking in the MMV plan are very heavy on data. And there's a lingering question here of what are you going to do with all this data? How are you going to manage it? Where is this going to be stored? And how are you going to consume it? So digital workflows that uh, enable you to take all of that and make decisions very quickly on the go are going to be key for the MMG plan success. But you need to be able to model what those thresholds are when potentially it passes a certain threshold, what occurs, what is triggered beyond that. And maybe you can talk a bit more about what happens when you cross those thresholds or, you know, how do we set those thresholds in place? One of the uh, common questions that we get from our customers uh, related to non-performance events is how to deal with the uh, a loss of integrity or a leak event. Um, it's, uh, it's probably one of the most severe um, events that could uh, occur on a storage site. When a storage developer apply for a permit to construct and then to inject, an emergency response plan, a crisis management plan has to be integrated. And as part of that crisis management plan, the response to a loss of containment or a leak event has to be defined irrespective of the severity. And the operator and the developer has to know uh, what are the data that needs to be monitored and the data that needs to be collected and, and measurements, how frequently they need to be um, collected and measured, how to report it, what is the uh, communication protocol to the regulator, to the community, to the stakeholders that are involved, what is the remediation plan as defined in the license to operate. This can be done manually, which could be, you know, extensive and, uh, and heavy on, on manpower. Or we have digital tools and digital enablers that can uh, automate the collection of that data, both in subsurface and surface, as well as uh, manage, process that data and provide insight to the operator to take the actual uh, and optimal actions uh, to remediate any non-performance event. Thank you all so much for joining me today. Uh, I think just to wrap up a little bit on all the things we've discussed related to MMV, I think we've very much highlighted the importance of MMV all the way from the earliest stage of a project through to the closeout. Uh, the importance of the planning aspects of continuously monitoring during operations and just how much all of those aspects can impact the overall cost and economics of a CO2 storage project. And I think it's important for us to continue this type of dialogue because there are numerous projects, as we stated at the very beginning, starting to come into operations now. And when you look at a pipeline, we're expecting 10-fold, 20-fold, maybe 100-fold projects to come online over the next couple decades. And when you think about the continuous evolution of MMV uh, from a technology innovation standpoint to the best practices and lessons learned, I think it will be an exciting time and a constantly evolving process that we can take great learnings from. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.